Hi, I'm David, and as you just heard, I'm the founder and CEO of Sender. Today, I have the pleasure to tell you all about my personal fundraising journey that allowed me to raise approximately 300 million euros. The focus of today is going to be my first fundraise. And as you will hear in a few minutes, it was a roller coaster. I'll tell you more about how I got to that roller coaster, and then also a couple of the loops and challenges I faced after my first fundraise. So, um, uh, let's kick this off. After telling you about my journey, I'm going to tell you also about three mistakes that I did, or almost did. And then I'm going to share also three learnings and recommendations with you for those of you who are about to fundraise. My objective today is to share my story, to give you young founders that are about to raise an idea on how such a journey could be and how to go through the good and more difficult times. So, as we're going to spend the next 30 minutes together, I quickly want to introduce myself. I started business, and after graduating in 29, back then, consulting was the cool thing. Startups and tech was just coming. And I went into management consulting to learn a lot, but this is also where I met my two co-founders, Nico and Julius, with whom, a few years later, I started Sender 2.0, but more to that later. After a couple of years in consulting, I decided to go back to university to take a break. The first two weeks of my MBA completely changed the way my career would develop and therefore also my personal life. Instead of going back to consulting, I decided to start my own company, Sender. So let's quickly zoom into these first weeks of my MBA. Back then, I did a group project. This is a picture from our graduation in 2015. But in 2014, we did a project for the founder of BlaBlaCar. He asked us fresh students to come up with ideas on how BlaBlaCar could evolve their business model. So we started working on an idea. And after graduating in 2015, I managed to convince one of my group mates, Nikki, it's a bold guy behind the four, to move with me to Berlin to start Sender 1.0. Back then, I still remember how I thought I had the best business idea ever and a beautiful presentation, and I only thought I have to execute that perfect plan. Back then, we managed to raise some money. I wouldn't consider this my first fundraise. It was more family, friends, classmates, and a couple of professors. They probably gave us some money because they didn't want to get one more call or one more email from us. So with around 30,000 euros, we moved to Berlin, Nikki and I, and we started to implement Sender 1.0. Sender 1.0 quickly was a same-day parcel delivery company that wanted to leverage buses, to move parcels cheaply between cities, and then with the first and last mile career, offer same-day parcel delivery to smaller e-commerce companies that were not called Amazon and Zalando that had to compete with the same-day offering. We tried this for one entire year, and we had zero customers. So we should have picked it up a bit earlier that the first business model was not great. To make things even worse, we were running out of money. We already hired a couple of employees, had set up operations. The picture that you saw earlier was actually our operations. And then we decided, OK, now we have to structure our first fundraise properly. So I participated um, in a couple of pitching events. One of these events uh, was with the angel investors. After my pitch, where I pitched the idea, which I knew was so-so, one of the investors approached me, asked me, David, can we go into a different room? I would like to talk to you about the investment opportunity. I said, great. So I went into the room. His name was Omar. And Omar asked me, David, how much are you raising? And I answered, 250,000 euros. And he said, we might have a problem. And I thought, OK, maybe I went in with a number that was too big. But he answered, I started investing at 500,000. I said, OK, Omar, I think we're going to find a way to work this out. So over the next few weeks, we started negotiating with Omar, the angel investor. 
He knew that we were running out of money, so he was willing to lend us some money that would then be converted into equity at a later moment. We were finalizing the term sheet. He is Canadian Jordanian, so he was on the way from Canada to Jordan and stopped in Berlin to finalize and sign the term sheet. He came, we signed the term sheet, and this is the moment where I thought, okay, I'm the coolest entrepreneur in Berlin. Don't have a business model that works, but money coming, so I'm gonna figure it out. And my back then co-founder told me, David, I have to talk to you. Can we go back to the room? I said, okay, but let's grab some beers, you know, no, I have to talk to you. So we get into the room. And Nikki told me very quickly that he's leaving Sender. We both sponsored student. He had an offer to go back to his management consulting company. And I understood that he was leaving for a good reason. In that same moment, I also understood that there was no future for Sender. I knew the moment I would tell Omar that 50% of the team was leaving, of the founding team was leaving, he would say no. I also didn't want to take the responsibility from our friends, classmates, and professors to continue on my own. And also finding a new business model that worked on my own is something that I didn't feel like I was up to. So eventually, we got a few beers, walked back home, we were living together, and really thought about how to close down the company, file for insolvency, it was a Thursday, we planned to go the next Monday um, to file for bankruptcy. We really had, we, we thought about where can we position our first employees that we have in startups that we knew. Had a couple of beers, finally, well deserved, I thought back then. And on my way home, I also called my father. My father is an entrepreneur, a bit of a role model, explained him the, him the situation. And my dad told me, David, there's one last thing you have to try to do before you give up. He told me, by the way, Learning how to file for insolvency is a good learning for a young entrepreneur. We said, before you go that path, try one more thing. Speak to the angel investor. Try to convince him. If he says no, it's clear that you file for bankruptcy. If he, if he says yes, you can still decide whether we want to do it or not. But you invested so much time and energy, try it. So I said, okay, I have nothing to lose. Let's try it. Called Omar, told him that Nikki was leaving. He was not amused. He thought we played him. He thought we planned this. Nikki also tried to call Omar. Same reaction. Didn't, didn't work out. And then a day later, I called Omar again. He was in Jordan visiting his family. And I told him, Omar, I'm very sorry. And I feel, felt very sorry. He invested a lot of time and really thought we played him. And I said, can I talk to you in person? And he said, David, very. Arabic from him, if you want to talk to me, you're always welcome to visit me. He said, you know what, Omar, I'm coming. Jumped on a plane the next day on a Sunday, flew to Jordan, first time. When I arrived there, I was welcomed by Omar, his family, and his entire business partners. It's a big table with food, tea, drinks. The first few minute, uh, hours was only about chit-chatting, getting to know each other. Then we went into a separate room smaller group of us, and we started really negotiating. It was like a bit of a movie, how I imagine a movie uh, unfolding. And we started negotiating, higher risk, we need more shareholding, we started negotiating, um, uh, and at the end, they got a very good deal. And at the end, everyone in that room ended up investing, luckily to one single entity, well, that was extremely important, but everyone was investing a total of 500,000 euros. Said, okay, said goodbye to everyone, at the door, Omar took me to his front door and he told me, David, you're not going to fail. And I was thinking, did Omar really listen to me? I was trying to be transparent. It's a startup, high risk. But I asked him, why do you think I'm not going to fail? And his answer was, you know, part of the family and we'll not allow you to fail. I never felt so much pressure in my entire life. On the way back to the airport, I really thought, should I really do this and get into, you know, even more pressure of people that, you know, believe in me and that might be disappointed later on. I ended up jumping on the plane, landing in Berlin. Two days later, felt like it was too late. I called my second, now new co-founder, told him, hey, 
I have a startup, 500,000 euros coming, looking for a co-founder, I have a few ideas, do you want to join? And he said, yes. And I said, great. There's only one condition I have, one ask. I need a place where I can sleep a couple of nights because I was living with my first co-founder, Nikki. So I moved in with Nico, my new co-founder, and his flatmate. A few months later, still living there, and the other flatmate had no choice but to join as third co-founder. Together with the two, we started Sender 2.0, a digital freight forwarder, as you had uh, uh, heard earlier. To my grandmother, I explained Sender as an Uber for trucks. We connect the likes of Coca-Cola that need to move freight from point A to B, point B with big trucks, with small trucking companies on the other side. This was working definitely much better. We were able to um, show some traction, finally some revenue. And this is then when, after my fundraise, there are a few other fundraisers that um, uh, followed. The second fundraise was also pretty tricky. We showed up at all the venture capital firms in Berlin, presented Sender, and they all told us, very nice model. We even liked the team, but there are six or seven other teams in Germany alone and around 20 in Europe doing exactly the same. But they told us, don't worry, come back in a year time when you show that you're growing faster and we happily give you the money. This didn't help us. We needed the money there because we're running out of again of money. Luckily, we found Scania, uh, a corporate investor that invested and that then unlocked our growth. And uh, over the years, we managed to raise money from a number of uh, very strong venture capital firms, including HV Capital, Project A, Axel, Lakestar, Bailey Gifford, and a few others as well. Now, three mistakes to avoid. Three mistakes that we made or we almost made at Sender. The first mistake you should be avoiding is to optimize only for shareholding. And this only applies to a situation where you have more than one term sheet. If you have only one term sheet, there's not much to optimize. You just have to try to best in your negotiation. But if you have multiple term sheets, try to find the right partner. After our round with Scania, things started developing very nicely. And we went back to all the VCs that told us, hey, come back when, when, when you're growing. And we were in a very privileged position. We had, I think, six or seven term sheets back then. And one of them was pricing sender significantly higher than all the others. And to be honest, back then, VCs for me were like very different, but also very similar. I didn't really know what made them special, how, how, how they were different from each other. So we almost went for the term sheet that paid the highest price, everything equal. Um, uh, this was, would have been the smart choice. Luckily, I spoke to a couple of founders that were already a few steps ahead. And the big advice they gave me, and I want to share this advice also with you, is to get to know your investors. If you have time, spend time with them, get to know them, because they're going to be next to you for many years and will take you or be on your side also in tricky and difficult moments. This is what we did, and this is why we decided not to go with the term sheet that paid the highest valuation, but a smaller term sheet uh, with a lower valuation. There's no rule of thumb that is precise on when to go for a higher valuation, but go with, always with people that you trust that you want to work with. And especially if your valuation early stage seed series A is within a range of 20% higher, definitely go for the person or the team that you feel like is the best partner. If it's more, think about it, whether it's a fair compromise you can do. The second mistake that we definitely did more than once is we underestimated how much work comes after signing a term sheet. This is when the due diligence process starts, and this is when you start negotiating the shareholders' agreement. And this takes a lot of time and resources from your team for the due diligence and from the management um, uh, in the weeks or sometimes months that you, go, that you need to go through this process. I still remember after our Series A, how 
we were growing and growing, and the incoming invoices from our carriers, the trucking companies, were piling up, and we just didn't realize that. So at a certain point, we were not paying invoices on time. Carriers said, we don't want to work with the company that doesn't pay on time. And literally, one or two weeks after we signed the deal, our revenue dropped massively yeah, because we didn't focus on that. Yeah? So a mistake that you should avoid is once you go through, the, recognize, first of all, that it's time consuming for you as founders, but also probably for your team, uh, and that you shouldn't start too many big projects in parallel. And I completely underestimated that, and it was not just one time, multiple times. Even now, uh, I still think I can manage both, but I see when you're in fundraising how much energy, how distracting it is, and how also the organization suffers from it. The third one is, might be a bit controversial for two reasons. One, because we are in a time where it's a bit more tricky to raise. And the second one, VCs maybe also have a slightly different view on this. But I would recommend to raise a little bit more money than what you think you need. Why is this twofold, or two reasons why? First, there are circumstances that you cannot anticipate. Like the situation we're in right now, where liquidity in venture capital went down massively, you have to extend your runway, having a bit more money in your bank helps a lot. The second reason why I think it can make a lot of sense to raise a little bit more than what you need is that some opportunities might come up that you did not anticipate. For Sender, for example, we raised our Series B with Excel, and I think it was five months later, we raised our uh, Series C um, uh, with Lakestar. And within our uh, investor base, there was a lot of debate. Is this the right thing? Do you want to raise really now more money? Let's wait, let's invest, let's increase the valuation. At the end, we found a good compromise. And thanks to that compromise and that fundraise, we were able to unlock two acquisitions that we didn't plan and that we would have not been uh, able to do without that extra cash. It was Uber Freight that we acquired in Europe and Everroad. And also these two acquisitions came in a time, Everroad, the first one, where we had the first lockdown. And then once again, like in these days, very concerned about the future, the ability of raising more money. And only because we had the liquidity not to pay for the target, but liquidity to finance also the burn and therefore the combined runway is the reason why we were able to do that. Yeah? And especially the acquisition of Uber Freight was a game changer for us. And again, we were only able to do that because we raised a bit more than what we think was necessary. Three learnings to consider. I think the first and most important thing is build a personal relationship um, with your potential investors, especially in these tricky times. Zoom works and Google Meets and all the other um, video conferencing systems work much better than I ever thought two or three years ago. But at the end of the, at the uh, end of the story, an investor invests in the team, in you as a founder. I don't think there's a better way to build a trust relationship um, than meeting these people in person. So even if it might be a bit early and you're not sure whether you're in the process, you can always reach out and say, hey, I'm in town to meet another investor. Would you be willing to meet me for a coffee? That personal relationship makes such a difference, especially in these times where it's more tricky to raise capital. The second one is time management. I already touched upon it earlier. It takes a lot of time and it's distracting, but you really have to manage your time. First, you have to create some sense sense on urgency, and I'm going to get back to that in my last point. But you also have to understand that you push first to get a term sheet, and the moment you get the term sheet on the table, the venture capital firm tells you you have a couple of days to sign it, three, four days. They want to put you now under pressure to say, hey, sign our term sheet. Why is this? Because, of course, they don't want you to go around shop shopping with, with the timesheet you have. I think it's a fair ask, but also here a learning that I made is take the time. Try to understand who is the right partner, build a personal relationship, 
not only with the person that maybe interacts with you, but also with the team that is behind that person and therefore the entire uh, VC plan. And things also take always longer than you anticipate. Finalizing a term sheet always takes longer. Finalizing the due diligence and the shareholder agreements takes even longer than that. Yeah? So plan for the time. And as mentioned earlier, don't try to do too many things. It's all taking longer than what you think it would, especially if you do it the first time. And I've done it a couple of times, and I still continue to underestimate how much work and how much time it takes. The last point also here, I think more relevant a couple of months ago, and hopefully again, relevant in a couple of months again, but you have to create some, surge, uh, some sense of urgency. If you don't create fear of missing out or FOMO, there's no VC that says, hey, okay, let's push this over the finish line now, unless they're super excited, which is not always the case. They take the time, and you need to find a reason why you create urgency. You say, I need an answer, indicative answer, final answer, by then, 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 because of this reason. So try to put deadlines that you then probably have to push anyway, but try to create a sense of urgency. If, of course, you have one term sheet on the table, that's the best way to create urgency and therefore FOMO. Um, and the last learning and piece of advice I would like to give and share with all of you is when you get the term sheet, negotiate. Improve the terms. It's not only because you can improve the deal for yourself, maybe for your colleagues if you include a, an option component, a virtual option or an ESOP component, um, and also for maybe other existing shareholders, angels, but also because that interaction, that negotiation, will show the venture capital firm that is about to invest in you how you're going to be behaving for future fundraisers and potentially at an exit. If you sign a term sheet that you get on the table, then why would a venture capital firm expect that the next time you get a, a term sheet or even an offer to sell the company, that you really squeeze out the best for them? So when you get the term sheet, make sure that you start negotiating. And sometimes it's not really possible. I acknowledge that. But there are always a few terms that you can try to improve. Have that discussion. I think it's a good sign um, uh, and a good indicator of how you will be behaving in the future. And with this, I already come to an end of my presentation. After the session, I have a mentoring slot over there for 30 minutes, where I'll be asking all the questions that you might want to ask. So if there are any questions that I haven't answered or that popped up while I was presenting, feel free to meet me after uh, in about 10 minutes over there. And with this, all the best for the early stage founders that are about to raise. It's not the easiest time, but I hope that by sharing my journey and a couple of learnings and a couple of mistakes we have made, that I have made, you are now in a better position for your next fundraise. And with this, thank you so much, so much for listening.